All right, good morning, church. If you're out in the lobby, come on in so I don't talk to an empty auditorium. <laughs> it makes me feel better. Good morning. Welcome here, guys, on this sunny Sunday. Um, I am glad that you are here together with us. I have a bunch of announcements this morning. They're testing my capabilities of remembering things, so I'm going to try my best. The first, we've got our kids downstairs, our kids program. It will be going on through the summer. So if you have a little bit of extra energy and you are like, yes, I can do this. Some of our regular volunteers would love to have a little break. Talk to the office if you're willing to spell them off for a week or two there in the summer. Secondly, stay and play. It's one of our newest ministries on Wednesday morning from 9.30. There it is, 9.30. If you are a parent with little people or you know of a parent with little people, come on out. It's a time to have coffee, hang out, let your kids run wild, and just get to connect with some adults. Youth this week, whoop, whoop. Last youth of the year, it is a paint party, not a paint on canvas kind of party, but a paint war party. So seven o'clock Tuesday at the church. Um, so come on out for that. Not next week, but the week after, June the 25th, there is a men's breakfast. I think it's the 25th. Let me check my paper. <gasps> yes. It's so the 25th, last Saturday of June, there is a men's breakfast at 8.30 here. Lots of food, so much food. John stressed more food than one can possibly eat. So come on out if you are a man, there is a breakfast for you. We would love to pray for you. This is one of the things our church does, um, but we don't always know what is happening in people's lives. So if you would like prayer for something specific, please get in touch with the office. You can email prayer at northstarchurch.ca. Um, we have a prayer team who would love to pray for your quests, would love to hear about your successes, your victories, the things you are still passionately praying for. So please get in touch with us. Year end giving, it is June. Our year ends, the fiscal year here ends at the end of June. So if you are thinking, yes, I need to get some money to the church, please do. June is the end. So please remember to give. Finally, no, I have two more. It was a joke. There's two more. July 24th, there's going to be a dedication service. So if you have small children and you would like to have the church pray for them and take a moment to dedicate them to God, that is the day for you. July 24th, the Tullet boys are being dedicated, so you will not be alone up here. Um, if you'd like to do, be a part of that again, get in contact with the office they would love to hook you up with that. Finally, at the end of the service today, don't run away right after that last song. Jeremy, who's part of the search committee for our lead pastor, will be coming up and sharing the results from the survey that we took a part of last week. So that'll be at the end of the service today. So don't run out because then you'll miss hearing about that. I made it. That was all the announcements. And if you missed them, I have a fancy paper. You can always ask me about them later. I would love to share. So let's just open up and pray for our service. If you could all just stand as we pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this place. Thank you for our ability to gather. Let us never take it for granted after having it taken away. That we can come together in this place, worship you, learn about you, talk to others. Be encouraged, be challenged to grow. As we come today, I just pray that we will be able to shed all the layers of worry, of stress, of our to-do list behind, that we'll be able to rest in your presence and hear from you this morning. I just pray that this will be a place that just oozes out you everywhere. And when people come here, they meet with you. They find healing, they find rest. I thank you for what you are going to do today. In your name I pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that through your blood, we are saved and we have the possibility of life forever with you. I just pray as we come today, come together to talk about the helmet of salvation, about how to protect our brain, this part of us. I just pray that you will clear our heads of the scattered thoughts that tend to overwhelm that we'll be able to listen to what you have for us today. I just pray for Pastor John as he comes, that he will hear clearly from you and be able to share what you have for your church today. And that as we walk out, we will walk out in the certainty, knowing that we are wearing this helmet, that we've got it, that we've got the protection we need. I thank you for speaking to us in your name. Amen. Just before we sit, I encourage you to all go say hello to a few old friendly faces and maybe find a couple new ones to say good morning to as well today. Good morning, church. I think you all missed the announcement this, this morning because you're all out there chatting away, having a jolly time. That is wonderful. We might have to tell you again, so check out our newsletter. Hey, I want to let you know before we start the sermon this morning, I'm going to steal some time for a second, five minutes. So it's, I've already told the tech team that it's not included in my sermon time, just so you know. Uh, you got a text this morning. Uh, from the church. If you're not on that text list, could you just head to uh, the Welcome Center? We want to update that text list. We want to make sure you're getting our texts. Not that the replies were very helpful this morning. I text uh, this morning, where is your head at? And I got our tech team sending back, well, it's uh, below my glasses and above my shoulders. 
Uh, and someone said, it's on my shoulders. So I got like three or four different smart techs. So thank you, tech team, for that. That was good. Hey, uh, we're starting to compile a list of like core books. Uh, well, I am, anyway. <laughs> core books that, uh, that you need to read or that, that you're coming to me saying, hey, how can I dive deeper into Scripture? How can I know what's good to read and not good to read? And I just wanted to give you, um, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to give you a heads up about some books you could be reading, you could be buying on Amazon. We're going to get a few of our core books, and we're going to put them at the Welcome Center, so that if you can't afford them, we'll just gift them to you. But if you can, then we ask that you can, you can pay for them. That would be great. But um, as we've been moving through the armor of God, lots of... Uh, uh, the armor of God and keeping the armor of God on, actually, uh, you need discipline to do so. There needs to be routine and discipline. And one of the core books that we would read in first year of Bible college, or uh, probably not seminary, but Bible college, is this book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Now, this book is great. It helps you with the disciplines. It helps you with solitude. It helps you uh, working through the best ways for you to spend time with Jesus every day. And also to take moments within a month to say, okay, I'm going to set, set aside maybe three, four hours and just dedicate that time to Jesus. So go and get yourself one of these copies. I'd love to hear what you thought of it. Another thing is, is we want to keep you worshiping, right? The, the worship that takes place in here in the way that we just stand still, uh, many of us watch worship albums through the week or watch Elevation or Hillsong or Maverick City Church, and they're just like on fire. They're on another level. They couldn't care less what anyone else was doing. And so we just want to keep bigging up and giving you opportunity to listen to some of the new music that's coming out too. And so Maverick, Maverick City Music, uh, they have a wicked new album called um, Simple Adoration. And so if you're on Spotify or uh, you want to buy the album, go do it. It's, it's just a phenomenal album. I'd love you to listen to it. Tell me what you think. Uh, praying. We have talked about prayer in church, but we're not doing a great job of knowing what's going on in each other's lives, especially from the office, so we can pray corporately. So I just want to remind you of prayer at northstarchurch.ca. You can send us an email and just write confidential, and then we won't tell anyone. We'll just put your name forward for prayer. We'll say, pray for this person. We don't need to know circumstance. God knows it. Or if you really want to give us some details and some specifics, you can put that in the email and tell us what we can and what we can't share with the wider church. But we've been praying for Cindy Logan, uh, she's had a stem cell transplant, and guess what? The doctors can't believe how well it's gone, but we can, right? Isn't that amazing? Just an answer to prayer. And then we've been praying for Jason Hackler, who had a heart attack a few weeks ago, and I'm in Prince George last week, and I go, John! And I'm trying to control like four little ones. John! I look around, it's Jason. So I walk over, I said, how are you doing? He said, we're doing great. There's no lasting damage, we don't think. A few more tests, but I'm doing really well. So I'm like, that's another answer to prayer. So church, we got to keep praying, yes? Yes, we got to keep praying. Uh, hey, lots of people have gone, hey, we're on a new pastor search. We're looking for a new pastor. And all the old people are making decisions for all the young people. How do I become a member? And so I want to let you know, if you want to become a member, come find me. Or you can head to our welcome desk and we've got forms for you. Or if you're online this morning and you'd like one of those membership forms uh, to fill in, then email us, uh, admin at northstarchurch.ca, and we will send you a form so we can go through that membership with you. I want to also give you the heads up about, Jesus says, believe and be baptized. So if you know Jesus and have not yet been baptized, you need to get baptized. It's the first thing he asks you to do. He doesn't stop to breathe. He says, believe and be baptized. And so me and my buddy Kyle... Uh, he's going to get baptized on September 11th. Is he in the room right now? Yeah, yeah, yes, Kyle's there. There he is. Kyle's going to get baptized on September 11th. He told me he wanted to do it on uh, Friday when we were having beers. And so I'm saying out loud, so you've got to hold him to it, which is wonderful. Uh, also, uh, I just want you to just note something for a second. I have a new friend in the room, and I'd love you to come say hi. He's my VIP guest for today, and his name is Brian, and he's just over here, right here. And if you give him a round of applause, he's my new friend. So make sure you just say hi to Brian today. We love him, and uh, welcome to today, Brian. We love you. <sighs> Summer's coming up. My family's coming, and I would like a little break from preaching. And so I'm going on vacation in a few weeks, and so if you know of anyone who... Um, who could step into the pulpit or who could preach. The elders and myself are trying to fill 
kind of some slots over the summer. And so if you know anyone or anyone that would be willing to step in and to take that opportunity, someone that loves Jesus, someone that's a Christian, and probably someone that's done it before, that would be helpful. Um, but if you can help us with that or know of any connections, we'd love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you because uh, we'll then fill those slots up. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's move into God's word. Let's take a moment to pray together. Father God, just thank you for this morning. Thank you for your church. Thank you that we get to be together. Thank you for this beautiful bride. Thank you that you look at us with the same eyes that we looked at our wives on our wedding day every day, with just tears of love and adoration and expectation and hope for what's to come. So Lord, help us to live into all of that as your church. Help us to hear your word. Help us to hear your instruction. Help us to hear your voice this morning and that we put it into action. Help us to be a church that loves deeply, that is true and transparent and honest with each other. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I just want to add also, and I know I shouldn't really be starting with this, but I'm going to add to it. A few weeks ago, we um, had an uh, EGM and an EGM at the back of the room where I was able to share with you uh, what I thought, where I thought we were as a church and where we're going as a church. And I was very, very clear with us as a church that we are not going to step into idle gossip. And this week, I had to have a really hard conversation with someone to say, you on, what you did and the way you spoke about our church and the way you spoke about people in our church is inappropriate. It's not going to happen. If you have a problem or you have a struggle or you have an issue, we've been really clear as elders and myself, the door's open. Walk into my office, shout at me, talk with me, and we will work it through together. We'll go through those feelings and emotions and figure out a way forward. But let's not hurt each other and let's not hurt this body in the process because we're meant to represent Jesus. And so, again, I'm just going to hold you all accountable as you place yourself under the authority of the elders and the leadership of the church. We're going to love you by saying this is not appropriate behavior. And so moving forward, we're going to be united. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Okay, back into the armor of God, helmet of salvation today. So far, we are still in Ephesians 6, and uh, we have been looking at the belt of truth. We've already done this already. We've looked at the breastplate of righteousness, and we've looked at the shoes of peace. We've spoken about the battle that, we in, that we're in, not against each other, but a prin against the principalities of the world. We've spoken about the belt of truth, which is the knowledge of our salvation in Christ Jesus. We've learned about truth objectively outside ourself, and that the word is truth. The word is where God explains who he is and who he has always been. We have learned that the breastplate of righteousness protects the heart that pumps blood or plants the spirit pumps the spirit of the living God through our bodies and our veins and the inner core of who we are so that informing our soul so that the brain and the mind and the spirit and the soul can make great choices. It is the heart that must be protected at all times for our new hearts were given to us by God himself upon our salvation. We learn about the gospel shoes of peace We've learned about the internal war that has been won and so we no longer have to fight. You're at peace because of this gift of grace. We've learned that salvation is irrevocable. We're going to go back there a little bit today, but we've learned that you can't take salvation away from someone. We've learned that as the battles to reclaim authority in your life, we come and we stand firm, assured of the truth of the gospel, because the three things that remain are faith, hope, and love. We've learned last week about the shield of faith, is God himself. We've learned that faith is the tangible access to the Holy Spirit via the gift of grace, believing that he will outwork his truth, grace, and miraculous actions in the physical. We have not seen the outcome of our journey, nor do we quite know the steps on the process, but we have to act and walk with faith, faith, believing he will step into all that he said he will step into. So therefore, Ephesians 6 verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, or at any time, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation. And take up the helmet of salvation. That's where we're focusing today. We're going to ask three questions as we look at the helmet of salvation this morning. Thank you. Uh, What is salvation is our first question. The second question is, what does the helmet do? And the third question is, how is salvation protected? Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on salvation, though it is the core doctrine of Scripture. It's the point we exist at the church. But I want to redefine uh, and re-explain what it is for those that that haven't been following us, uh, but also to uh, get you to understand that salvation, again, You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will eventually be fully saved. And so there are three theological words that help us to define salvation. The first one is justification, the second is sanctification, and the third one is glorification. Let me read you this from Ephesians 2, 8-9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, so faith through grace has been saved, and this is not your own doing, but it is a gift of God, not a result of works, you can't earn it, so that no one may boast, only God may boast, only God may say, I gave that to you. For we are his workmen, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What are our good works in him? Our good works is to go into the world and make disciples. It's to use the faith that we have been given to go, uh, to use that faith to have others come to know Jesus. That is justification. We were made just before Christ. God did save us. We have been saved. At that moment, it was just as if we had done nothing wrong. Or another way of putting it, it was just as if we'd done everything right. Isn't that cool? Sanctification. This is the outworking. This is what we're doing today. We are being sanctified daily. Just imagine if you were in a dishwasher every single day and it was turned on and it goes cycle after cycle after cycle as you are being cleansed and clean and washed and outworked. You are, Jesus is doing that himself as he pours the Holy Spirit over you. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why are we fearful and why are we trembling? Because we have this faith. We have been called to a mission to go into the world and make disciples. And God has called us to do this. And I know my kids are fearful of me when they don't do what I ask them to do. So your fear and trembling would be God himself when you stand before him and say, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? Surely the God Almighty, if you understand how powerful and mighty and majestic he is, surely you may be scared just a little bit. And then glorification. We will be saved one day. We are living with a hope to be like Christ in heaven. Romans 13, 11 says, Beside this you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than we first believed. So that is salvation. Justification, sanctification, where we are now, and hope, glorification, that we will be with him in eternity forever. Assured hope, definite knowledge. So what does a helmet do? Well, why do we wear helmets? We wear all types of helmets as human beings. Scooter helmets, I don't know why that was the first one that came to mind. I laughed at myself, scooter helmets, I don't even ride a scooter. BMX helmets, climbing helmets, football helmets, lacrosse helmets, snowboard helmets, horseback riding helmets, downhill mountain bike helmets, and ski helmets, and if you're my children, helmets around the house for fun. See, we want to protect the brain. We know as human beings that we should protect the brain. 
The brain is a complex organ that controls thought, memory, emotion, touch, motor skills, vision, breathing, temperature, hunger, and every process that regulates our body. Together, the brain and the spinal cord that it extends from makes up the central nervous system of our body. Our brain is the central nervous system. It's our brain that allows us to physically function as human beings. We protect our brains because we know as humans that our body can be alive, but if there is no brain function, the body might as well be dead. One of my heroes... I'm a big Formula One motor racing fan. And one of my heroes is Michael Schumacher. Michael Schumacher is a seven times world champion. It was when cars were real and they were not electric, when it, you heard the V12 engines roar and we'd come home from church. In fact, we wouldn't talk to anybody after church because my dad would hold us by the scruff of the neck, get us in the car to be home by 12.30 so we could watch the start of the race. It was our family thing. And then we would what, eat our... English roast dinner on our knees in front of the TV, binging out. And if we spoke, we were in trouble. But it was our thing. It was our thing as a family. I love it, and I still love it today. But Michael, Hero, Michael Schumacher was one of my heroes growing up. He drove for Ferrari. And one day, he went on a family ski trip. But he didn't wear a helmet. And he came down the French Alps, and he hit a tree. In a coma, it was all over the world news. He was in a coma for over a year. And then when he came to, he wasn't the same man. He hit his brain so hard that some of the things that he used to be able to do, he could no longer do. The thought of him ever getting back in a car again, crazy, never going to happen. It must have been the most frustrating thing in the world for him. KPBS News in 2008 interviewed Dr. Hayden. Hayden was a 71-year-old doctor, had all the medical training, but he had early-onset Alzheimer's. He realized that something was up when he started to forget things, when he couldn't remember how he got from his house to his office. His family started to notice his demeanor of frustration and anger was impacting all of the relationships in his life. So his friend at the clinic said, maybe we should give you an MRI. Maybe we should check out the brain. So they did. And they realized, yeah, it's Alzheimer's, early onset. But it was this, with this understanding... With this diagnosis that he knew really on in life, that he was able to work towards a plan to care for the people around him. He was able to tell the people he loved what, they, what he thought of them. He was able to tell the people he loved what they meant to him. He was able to write down the stories that he wanted to know for the generations to come. He was able to find hope and peace in the situation, knowing that what was to come, he could not change. But he would be ready, at peace, having knowledge that he had prepared everything for the future. The helmet protects the hope in our salvation for a future with Jesus. Come with me on a conversation for a second. Are you ready? The helmet protects the brain. So what does the brain do? It processes information. What does the brain do with the processed information? It decides a course of action or a reaction. We can act or react as people in two different ways. Verbally or physically. We, we outwork and act or we scream at someone. Our frame of mind and the intensity of our emotional feelings depend on how the information is processed or filtered in the mind. The feelings help us filter what's going on in our mind. The inclination of our frame of mind can be assessed by the good old debate of nature versus nurture. 
Our nature is determined by the pre-wiring of our genetic and biological makeup that could be argued is ingrained into our frame of mind from birth. In other words, it's your God-given looks, personality, gifts, and talents that you could not have learned. Yes, you can refine them, but you could not have learned them or have, have yourself teach yourself them because it is a gift from God. I look at all of my children. They have had the same mom and dad. They've been brought up the same way. They're all church babies. And... Forrest is kind and sensitive and chatty and takes up all your time. And Remington is a destroyer of all things. <laughs> they have exactly the same upbringing, exactly the same parents, but completely different wiring. Some say nurture has more to do with how we portray our frame of mind. Nurture includes the upbringing, the environment, the exposure, all the experiences of life. Now, this could be a a great upbringing, which frames your mind in a positive light, or it could be the worst upbringing. Your parents were useless. You were hurt and abused, and it was painful, and it was horrible, but it frames your mindset because it's what your brain is taking in, and it's what you're learning, and it's what you're experiencing that then helps you to feel what you feel when circumstances come up in your life. Who can remember the old film, Grease Lightning? Remember that film, Grease Lightning? Two people are admitting it. Who had leather pants that tight? No one's admitting that one. One person is admitting that one. Anyway, uh, so I remember that movie, and I got to the end, and there was this uh, funfair scene. And there's this fun house, and they're shimmy and shaking along the fun house, and they go through all these different sections. And I remember one day, uh, back in England, we went to a fun house, and I remember there being some funky, twirly mirrors. And so I want you to imagine for a second that we're in the fun house this morning, and we go, we've gone through all the different things, we've gone through the shaker, we've gone down the slides, and now we're walking into the last room in the place. And we go through the door, and it's a dark room, and there are six mirrors along the, the side of the fun house. And each mirror has a spotlight above it, just like this one. And as you move from each mirror to mirror to mirror to mirror, each mirror is framed and formed and twisted in a different way. So this one, I've got a massive head. You might say that's normal, that's okay. But I've got big head. In this one, I've got huge hips. In this one, my shoulders are way out here. In this one, my eyes are popping out of my head. And in this one, I've got thunder thighs. And then I walk out of there going, whoa, is that really who I am? If you believed what you saw in those mirrors, in that reflection, how would you feel just based on what you saw? How would you truly see yourself if you believed those reflections in the mirror? You may feel devastated, ugly, sad, worthless, or weird. Or some of you might believe that you're hot stuff and God's gift to mankind. I'm pastorally working that through with Jean. We will get there. We will deal with that issue. <laughs> Either way, many of us would feel some emotions that do need to be put into perspective beyond the reflections in these mirrors. We need to unplug the fun house. We need to turn off the music that's going on around us that's distracting us. We need to turn on the lights, not just the spotlights. We need to turn on the real lights. We need to shed light on the situation so that we can see who we truly are. We can see that what we're seeing is an illusion. Because when you shed the light of Jesus onto a situation, defuncting a situation, changing the reflection, understanding the reflection, It brings peace and relief. We have to make sure that our feelings, our environment, and our circumstances are not the deciphering factors in the decisions that we make. We need to make sure that the decisions we make are not ingrained in the illusion of life, 
but that we work through them, recognizing them as indicators that we need to look beyond ourselves for answers of truth. So why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Is what I'm feeling truly reflective of the situation? And if I turn the light on and if I shed the truth of Jesus on the situation so that I might see it clearly? It says in Isaiah 26, 3, keep, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Philippians 4, 6 to 8. Now we hear this lots. We hear this verse lots and, we, and many of us have, have learned it, but just concentrate on it this morning. Don't just brush over it. Really focus on it this morning. Philippians 4, 6 to 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We need to keep our minds on the truth of Jesus, listening for the affirmation of the Spirit working in our lives. It is the training, teaching, and experiences in knowing the truth that will help us choose a righteous living. Our feelings are a powerful tool that indicate to us that a belief is being developed or a truth is being affirmed cognitively in our minds. It is the job of the Christian to take hold of our feelings and to use our feelings as a barometer measured against the Word of God. This is what I'm feeling. This is what the Word of God says. This is what I'm feeling. This is what the Word of God says. Not to push the feelings to one side and believe in the Word of God, but to take those feelings and say, something has happened, something I have not let go of, something that has affected me is causing me to feel this way and I need to align it to the Word of God. Rather than pushing those feelings to one side, maybe I need to find forgiveness. Maybe I I can accept forgiveness and forgive everybody else, but I can't forgive myself. It might be that you're going, hey, I was so hurt and so broken that I can't forgive this person ever for the thing that they did to me. It might be that you think that you are the best thing since sliced bread and that you can do all things on your own and you get to live your life your own way. Maybe you need to align that back with Christ when Christ said, hey, pride, I hate it. You're not all that because I am the I am, therefore you are the you're not. So the helmet we, however, make this equation so complicated because we are either not protected nor have we understood salvation. So the helmet, the helmet of salvation that we're talking about today indicates that we're in a battle. We're still in the battle. We're still in the armor of God. And salvation is what the helmet is protecting. So then why are we trying to protect something that we know we already have? And I know I've asked this question before, but I'm reminding you, why are we we doing that? Romans 8.16 says this, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. We know our salvation because it has been affirmed by the transforming power of the Spirit. Now, if you sit in this room this morning and tell me that you don't know the Spirit, you don't know how the Spirit works, I would ask you, or you don't know the transforming power of the Spirit, I would ask you if you have actually given your life to Jesus. Because Scripture says it will bear witness, not just to others, but to you. There needs to be a change in you. This is your old self. This is your new self. If you get something new, you go, oh, what a nice, pretty dress. That's brand new. You don't look at the old one and go, that's gross. That's awful. I really like that one. No, you have to change from the old into the new. 
And then also we see that suffering is not optional. Suffering is a must. And quite frankly, you may be having it hard and you might be finding it tough, but you can't suffer any more than Christ did. God gave his son to die on a cross, a cross, cross, <laughs> what's a cross? I don't know. On a cross, the most painful, agonizing way after all of the people around him reject him. He knows, Jesus knows what suffering is, and the Father knows what suffering is because he gave his son and watched his son go through it. And how hard is it as a parent to watch your children go through pain? Super hard. Paul knows that salvation is irrevocable. That's, that's really not what he's talking about when he speaks about the, self, the, the helmet of salvation. You can't unknow something. But we, what he is trying to say here is that if, sal- <laughs> if salvation exists in Christ, and we know that Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he was and he is and he is to come, and now we're in Christ then were we not with him yesterday, today, and forevermore? Were we not with him in his suffering? Are we not with him in this new life? Of course we are. So therefore, if we're in Christ and we're with Christ, then we do not need to protect something we already have. It's like memories with Jesus. You've all had experiences with Jesus. Maybe you had an experience with him when you came to know him. You can't steal those memories away from you, so go and make more. They can't be taken from you. You know that you know. But knowing all of that, being assured of all that, I can live into my future salvation, or I can live with hope and be instrumental in the faith needed for others to receive this salvation. See, the purpose of salvation is all about humanity's reconciliation to God. It's not just about you. You're a part of that reconciliation. You're a cog in the big working mechanism of reconciliation with Christ. Do you know how powerful your story is? Do you know how powerful your testimony can be? No one can argue with your testimony. I did this, and I did this, and I did this. If you came up to me and said, no, you didn't, I'd be like, you weren't there. How do you know? Testimony is so important. And are you ready to share it? Do you know what God has done so tangibly in your life that you could communicate that to someone tomorrow? See, you must have heard the gospel from someone. Someone must have had faith, received the grace of salvation through God's love. And then as we come back to that faith, and live in this sanctification and outworking of Christ, we live with a hope for a future, knowing that in this moment, it is not just by our own faith that we are saved, it is this faith, it is this outworking of this faith, that is a part of the big restorative plan of Christ to him. It is your, by your faith you are saved, and it is that application of your faith that will bring others to Jesus because you're outworking it. You're doing what God told you to do, to go into the world and make disciples, to share your story. So as you walk by faith, people will see how you're walking. Colossians 2 verse 6 says, So then, just as you received by faith Christ Jesus as Lord, Continue by faith to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught by someone with faith and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, we hear this all the time. Why can't we just abuse grace? We've got it. We have this salvation. Why can't we abuse it? Why can't we just say, I'm saved Stuff everyone else. You could do that, but again, as we've already said, we don't want to stand in front of God having missed out on the opportunities and the things that he had for us to do as part of the restorative plan to him. Now, I'm not sure you've had many preachers say this, but I like to be transparent and truthful as possible. Some sin is really fun. Let's be honest. If sin wasn't fun or attractive, 
then why would we be trying not to sin? Some of the best youth work I have ever seen, seen, sin? (laughs) Some of the best youth work I've ever seen has involved reframing what sin is or behavior that is in that is in one environment unacceptable but placed into a different setting can actually be celebrated so let me give you an example and a friend his name was Caleb he did junior high ministry he wanted to start this new ministry and he had a group of kids that just loved him just loved the guy and he decided that um, in order to grow his youth group his big launch kickoff he was going to go to the scrapyard and buy two vehicles. Now, he needed to make sure that these vehicles had windows and bumpers and were pretty much all put together. And then he did a deal, spent like 800 bucks on these two vehicles and had them delivered to a church parking lot. So he laid down tarps all over the church parking lot. And then he went out to Rona and he bought spray cans. He bought sledgehammers. He bought pickaxes. He bought goggles and helmets and glasses. And his big kickoff was, here you go, kids, put your goggles on, put your hat on, smash it to death. Bam. He had like 200 kids smashing these cars to death, pulling out the seats, ripping the seats apart. Like kids that he then earned the right to have a discussion with because he's like, oh, this is cool. This is good. In this setting, it is good because I'm giving you permission in the right environment. Whereas if you did that to my car now, it would be wrong. But in that environment, in that setting, what usually would be sin, when redefined by the brain, while redefined in the environment, actually becomes something beneficial. Sin is the heart state in which the action is performed, which only then reveals the tumbling consequences to the body, heart, soul, and mind, and strength if the heart is in the wrong place. Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 says... You are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You are weakened, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. If you thought it, you might as well do it. Because it was the reflection of the heart. And he, Jesus, said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. And all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. It's about recognizing who you are and your old heart state that you've been saved from. It's about keeping your mind as far as you can from the potential of the action that you could perform physically. See, Satan was cast from the presence of God, and I believe that unrepented sin and perpetual sin will not separate us from the love of God. It won't separate us. Or it won't separate us from being an eternity with him in heaven. But I think momentarily until that sin is dealt with. I think it separates us from his voice. And it pains him to watch his children to suffering and enduring the consequences of that continual sinful battle between Satan and his legions and the kingdom of God on earth. Backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sin brings two types of suffering for us on earth. Suffering as consequences of other actions. So if someone hits me, their sin is to hit me, I am dealing with those consequences. You can go on and on and on with that. And then self-inflicted suffering, where we've made really bad choices. I had four sausages at Kyle's house around a campfire. 
That was a bad choice. I dealt with the consequences. In both types of suffering, we have this tendency to question God and the legitimacy of his promises. Ultimately, for many of us, we lose hope in those circumstances, in that suffering, in that brokenness, in dealing with those consequences of the sinful nature of when Satan made that mistake when Satan had pride and decided that he was better than God. From that moment, it's not Adam and Eve's fault, it's from that moment on that all of us struggle with hopelessness because we are in this battle. We say things like, no one can help me because no one understands. I feel like giving up. It's too late now. It's too late for me. I missed my chance. I have no hope. I will never, ever be happy again. My situation will never get better, and I have no future. Even Job cried out to God in Job 17, 15, Where is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Help me, church. Who can see it? Because I can't. I can't see this hope. It's hurting so much. And I love it when Peter says, Suffering is only for a little while. Kind of puts into perspective that we're only here for a blip of our life. That is our life in God's eyes because all eternity with him goes on and on and on and on. It's like a sermon from me. First Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you where physically but also in the mind how do we believe in jesus amongst the pain and the suffering and the hopelessness in 1974 dr aaron beck designed the beck hopelessness scale with the aim of quantifying the feelings of hopelessness by examining an individual's thoughts and beliefs about the future this scale is, to, is, is used to measure three things. Hopelessness, oh, to measure, sorry, primary, measure three aspects of hopelessness. Feelings about the future, decreased motivation, and expectations. Isn't that cool? Feelings about the future, decreased motivation, and expectations was measured as aspects of hopelessness. Dr. David Burns goes on to write, and he wrote a good book. I actually did some counseling at one point. I found life really tough. I felt hopeless. This is really a sermon for me this morning. And uh, I ended up with a 70-year-old counselor, Pentecostal minister who'd been in ministry for three or five years. And he also had all his degrees in psychology and counseling and pastoral counseling. And he brought me back from the most broken place of despair and hopelessness. And he gave me this book from Dr. David D. Burns, and it was called Feeling Good. And so I read this book, and I read it over and over again at times where I still feel hopeless. And he writes, research studies have shown that your unrealistic sense of hopelessness is one of the most crucial factors in your development of a serious suicidal wish. I've been there. Because of your twisted thinking, you'll see yourself in a trap from which there seems to be no escape. You jump to the conclusion that your problems are insoluble. Because your suffering feels unbearable and appears unending, you may erroneously conclude that suicide is your only way of escape. That's not true. And if you're struggling, I know I say every time I'm going to mention the word suicide on stage, that's going to trigger some people. And if you're struggling with that today, or you want to talk about that, or you're thinking about that, don't do it. Jesus loves you. And I want to talk through whatever's going on in your life. We're here for you. And maybe I'm not that person to walk through it with you, but we can find you someone. I promise you there's someone you can talk to. There seems to be this age-old debate between clinicians arguing how hopelessness is birthed in an individual. Is it depression that brings the feelings of hopelessness? Or is it hopelessness that brings the feelings of depression? Either way, the medical world sees hope as an essential for human health. 
We as Christians see hope as essential for a Christian life. I'm so excited right now. As a 35-year-old man, I don't often get excited, but I'm excited because my parents are coming. They're coming from England in a few weeks' time. Roz's parents are coming first. Not so good. But we, I'm joking, I love my mother-in-law. She's amazing. But they're coming, and we're going to have like kind of four weeks of just family together. I haven't seen them for three years. And so, so for me, I've lived in Canada 10 years now, and when I don't have a date when they're coming... It's really hard. You get used to it, but it's hard. And then there's Thanksgiving, and then there's Christmas, and they're all together, and you're FaceTiming, and it's not the same. And you miss them, and you want to be with them, but you know that you're positioned where God wants you right now, and, and you're effective right now. And maybe that will change another, an, another time in our life. But right now, we're where we're meant to be, and we're assured of that. But giving up that time with our family is really hard. And without a date, knowing when I'll next see them, it's really hard to have hope. In fact, some of my family, like my grandfather's come this time, and it could be, for me, the reality is it could be the last time I see him. And so now, we've always lived in Ontario, near Roz's family, and now we're in BC. Roz comes up to me during the pandemic, and just in, with tears in her eyes, as I give her a big hug, and she says, I now know how you feel. Like, I just don't know when I'm going to see them again. And so then when we eventually got this date that they're all coming and we're going to dedicate our children, there's hope, there's life, there's motivation, there's long lists of jobs. It just is ready. Our life is different. It has hope for a future. We know that we're getting ourselves ready so that nothing will come in the way of us sitting with our family, having joyous, miraculous, beautiful moments in prayer, times where we get to spend with each other, reflecting on the past, getting to know each other again, and being intimate face to face again and this is the hope we live for with Christ is that we don't know when he's returning but he is coming and until that day together we're all in the same boat so we need to just as I gave Ross a hug you need to give each other a hug and say he's coming it's okay stand firm hold tight get the brain in order he's coming because he said he's coming Because the word says it's true, we need to protect that brain. Even God in Isaiah 59 himself put on the helmet of salvation. Because at a moment he was like, are these people ever going to be restored back to me? And he had to remind himself of his plan. He had to remind himself of the Jesus that he was going to put on the cross. Salvation will come. Salvation will come. I'm protecting my head. Salvation will come. And as Christ says, salvation will come, we put on the same helmet that God did and say, salvation will come. This hurts. I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Colossians 1.27 says to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Hebrews 10.23, let us hold unswavering to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will run the race that God has given us, and they will walk and they will not be faint. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Trust that he will do what he said he would do so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we come into land, Paul here, when he talks about the helmet of salvation, he's wanting you to know that we need to protect our hope. We need to reframe our mind, not on today, We need to live for today, 
with a bright hope for tomorrow that we'll stand face to face in eternity with Jesus. And we need each other to help protect this brain. We need to give each other a hug and remind each other that he's coming. He's coming. We, that date will come. We will be there. That's why the church is so important. Paul wants us to live with purpose, to live with direction, to live by faith and with faith through faith. Live knowing that people's lives depend on sharing the gospel. Live with risk for the sake of the kingdom. Live with generosity. Live in a way that confuses the world. Live in a way where the world looks at you with different eyes. And live with different eyes yourself as you are watching for the battle that is taking place around you. Live by the power of the Spirit, expecting the miracles in your life. Live knowing that you're a child of God. Live knowing that you are His for all eternity. And live with determination, church, knowing that no matter what the struggle, you live with hope in Christ. Amen? Let's stand together, shall we? Father God, thank you for your message this morning. Help us to put on the helmet of salvation. Lord, I love when you you go back and look at the Roman battle, Father, when you go back and look there. You have a general at the front of the battle. But you also have a general at the back of the battle. And we know that you are the general up front leading us into battle. You're the one we're looking to for the instruction. We're the one that is looking at the peacock feathers on your helmet in front of us, keeping our eyes focused on you so that we can see you and hear you and know that you're there. And Lord, I get to be the general and the pastor at the back of the church, the back of the people, serving the people, saying, "Uh uh-uh, you're not going anywhere. Stay strong. Stand firm. We're in this together. You agreed to this. You signed up for this. Father, help us to encourage each other and build one another up in love and faith. Help us to keep us on the journey. Help us to reframe our mind by the power of your spirit. Come and change our minds. Do not let the enemy get a foothold in our mind. Lord, I pray that we won't listen to the logic of the world because it's not logic, because in you there is no logic because you're miraculous and you're uncomprehendable and you're bigger than we could ever dream or imagine. Thank you for your hope. And Lord, those that don't have hope this morning, that are lost, if I beg of you, you'll bring them to the foot of the cross bring them to the truth. Father, those that have feelings that they can't get under control today, I pray for healing. Pray for clarity. Biblical, spiritual clarity. Father, for those that we know are struggling, may we be the church and reach out. And Lord, there are so many in Cornell that don't have hope. population of 22,000. I can't get that out of my head these past four weeks. I beg of you, may every one of them come to know you. Don't put Quinnell on the map, put Jesus on the map. Bring revival. I pray these things in the power of of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. We love you forevermore. And everybody said?
song, Where Does Your Hope Rest? I encourage you, if you don't know that you're wearing that helmet of salvation, talk to someone today. There are pastors, there are people, turn to anyone and say, how do I get this helmet on? And if it's on your head, that's not it. I kind of have this image of us in battle. You don't just stand there with a helmet. You're going to get hit. You move forward. It's active. How are you sharing with others? How are you living out this salvation and this hope? And going, where are we hoping in? We're hoping in the end of this, that we will spend eternity in heaven. The victory will be ours. And if you see someone standing beside you without a helmet, help them get it on. Pick up those who are falling. Encourage them to keep moving. This is a process, guys, so that one day we can celebrate together. Just wanted to go back to that verse from 1 Peter. So 1 Peter 5, verses 10 to 11. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, don't go anywhere. Jeremy is coming, and he would like to share the results of the survey with all of you. So you can all have a seat while he speaks. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the search committee, we just wanted to um, share what we found from those surveys you all filled out last week. Uh, thank you. And so we had 84 surveys that were back to us by midnight on Tuesday. About half of these were church members, uh, and the rest are um, you all that are in the congregation as well. And about 15 of those were our elders, staff, and church ministry leaders. And we saw responses from both people that have been here in person as well as those watching online. Uh, in terms of the experience that um, you as the church have indicated we're looking for in our coming lead pastor, uh, almost 85% indicated the need for experience in a pastoral role. And of that, about half said a past experience in a pastoral role in a multi-staff church. And um, many of you indicated that life experience or age shouldn't be a major factor in who we look for. And about three quarters indicated that our coming lead pastor should have a seminary or Bible college education. Uh, as a church, we see the need for a pastor who comes from a congregation with strong ministry in teaching, outreach, and evangelism, as well as discipleship. Uh, the survey showed that demonstrated ministry in music and youth areas weren't as important in a lead pastor, and that fits well with where we are as a multi-staff church that brings on other staff for those areas. Um, we have a clear desire shown in the survey for a lead pastor who's demonstrated ministry to all ages, uh, different age groups in the church, and not too focused on any one. Uh, and in the survey, we also saw that a lot of people indicated they have no preference for the lead pastor's sermon style. And those who did show a preference, uh, as you can see behind me, it's a pretty wide range of styles people are looking for. Um, in terms of ranking the importance of the duties of the lead pastor, um, as a church, you've lovingly indicated that the most important thing is that our lead pastor doesn't neglect his family life, uh, and this matches the scriptural call we're given and highlights that we don't want to overwork a pastor. Uh, we want him to still have time for his family. Uh, next was he needs to have an ability to communicate faith and belief through inspiring speaking skills. So we really want someone who can preach to the congregation well. Uh, third was an emphasis on teaching the congregation. So we want that to be a primary role and not something that just falls in, in spare time. And we also want someone who works well with the individuals and groups within the church, such as committees and elders. Uh, the other things that kind of rounded out the top half um, of the importance we see in a pastor's duties are setting and communicating a clear vision for the future of the church, an ability to delegate well, and encouraging the church into an evangelistic witness, teaching the model of biblical giving, 
and developing the lay leaders in the church. Um, in the survey, we saw that the church doesn't see it as a requirement for the lead pastor's wife to be involved in ministry, but I'm sure we all see that as a huge blessing if that's something we have. Uh, and it was also lower in the ranking for visitation roles, so I think we're going to continue to see that that be something that's delegated amongst a variety of people. Um, we've been encouraged by all the comments you filled out in the survey. Um, some of the highlights of those were people wanting a lead pastor who is alive, passionate, guided by the Spirit, outgoing, encouraging, and preaches spiritually based, scripturally based sermons. Many of your comments also indicated a desire to see Pastor John as our next lead pastor. And we hear all your comments. Uh, there was about 32 of them. And we're thankful for your prayers and encouragement in that. Um, we ask that you would continue to pray for God's will and guidance for our church through this process and in all ways. Uh, for those of us um, that have been called to search on, serve on the search committee, and especially be praying for our next lead pastor. We hope to give you a next update soon uh, once we receive an application or have more news on the process. Thank you. And John just reminded me I was going to uh, pray for our church, um, so please join. Uh, Father, we thank you for those that have filled out um, surveys uh, and been encouraging. Uh, we pray that you would um, guide our church through this time, Lord, that your will would be made clear. Um, we pray that you would be working in all of our hearts and minds to prepare us for what you have planned for us, Lord, and especially um, in Pastor John as he leads us in this interim period and for um, our lead pastor moving forward. Um, whether it's someone from within our walls or beyond, we just pray that you would really um, guide us to your will in that, Lord. In your name, amen.